human assets. I think uh, one of the characteristics of the four or five people which I mentioned was they never hunted people. See, for example, today we want to develop an institution. The moment when we establish, we try to look at whom we have to recruit and what kind of a people, specialized people, who is good and where to hire them or where to get them. But these uh, people, you know, if you look at uh, Krishnamurti, Krishnamurti never looked at people outside. He got people from internally generated. I think all you remember after independence, we created public sector. Public sector was mainly managed by Indian bureaucratic system. The IAS officers were the managing directors, the chairman, board of directors of all the public sector. But uh, Krishnamurti brought a team of professionals, SPS Raghavan, and uh, Bhargava, these kind of a people, and he developed his own team in public sector. I think that is where the, the visionary leaders does. They don't go hunt for the people. They create their own team within organization. I think that is where investment has to be made. Either me or Odai or uh, if you look at uh, Upendra Dharji, all of us, we never looked at people outside. We have created our own team within the organization. I was with PAC more than 25 years. After I became the director, I never hired for any senior position outside. We created our own team. We built our own team. I think the most important is building and investing uh, people is very, very important for uh, uh, developing an institution. So this, these are certain characteristics of a good institution building. Let me explain the process in which uh, PAC we try to build an organization, PhD Institute of Management. As I said, PhD Trust started in 1924, and it was uh, with the starting of a school. And in fact, some of my Ames colleagues have come to our campus, they have seen. The local village, that's a Pilamedu, is called, now it's a part of a Coimbatore city. Here in 1920s, it was not a, a part of a town, it was a small village. So that village children, they didn't have an opportunity to study in schools, good schools. So they were looking for starting a school. The villagers all decided to start the school. At that time, uh, most of the schools were managed by Christian missionaries. And uh, they were managing and the admissions preference were given to particular section of society. So this uh, people, local community was deprived of getting admissions. And these people all decided that they wanted to start a school. That is how a school was started. And the school, they were not able to manage and they handed over to the PhD family and they created a charity trust and then it started. So when they created the school, they named the school as a Sarvaj Jala School. It school belongs to everybody. I think, please look at the 1920s, they had a vision of creating an organization where without any or religious or caste, they wanted to create a school and they named the school also Sarva Jana School. 1924, uh, sorry, 1921 the school was started. So uh, that is where the vision and also the transparency started coming. So the first school was started, then slowly they looked into the society needs. That's what I said, the institution should serve the society needs and also looks for the development of the society. So when they looked at the local school importance, they started the school and that after that the Second World War came and then there were demand for local uh, trained technical people. And also the Coimbatore developed uh, into a small industrial town. They started manufacturing motors. The first motor was developed by PSG Industrial Institute and the electrical motor was developed by them. And again the technical force from PhD institutions. So they thought that technical education is very, very important. That is how they started the PhD Polytechnic College. And after a few years, then they moved to PhD College of Arts and Science, then they upgraded into PhD College of Technology. And even they had a vision to bring a leader of the business school. As I mentioned, they didn't want to hire somebody from outside to get the team. So what PhD family did is their own son was sent to UK and they educated him to bring, brought him back to head the uh, engineering college. So he would become the first principal, was a Jiyada Modern, subsequently become the vice chancellor of Madras University. He's a great educationist and he was also member of AACP and all the bodies he was involved. So uh, again, you know, they brought their own team to head the institution and they trained them. 
and in 1940s and 50s, all the principals of PhD institutions were sent to US or UK, and they trained them, educated them. They were brought back, and they were heading the different institutions. Okay. Then uh, we started PhD because of technology, and uh, PhD contributed the development of a Coimbatore city. So when they developed the Coimbatore, when Coimbatore city was becoming a textile city, and also engineering industry was dominated the, in the entire development of the city of Coimbatore. So they were looking for more technical, that's why engineering college sub, supported, and Coim, PhD promoted the entrepreneurship. Today, thousands of uh, our alumni are successful entrepreneurs in and around Coimbatore and also state of Tamil Nadu. So they promoted the entrepreneurship. So these entrepreneurs was interacting with the PSG. So they were, when they were interacting with them, they said, we are very good technically trained people. We studied in PSG Polytechnic. We also studied in engineering college. But we don't have a good management knowledge. We, don't, we are not good in marketing. We are not good in finance. So you should help us. So that is how, in 1970, PSG started management education. We started with a diploma program, and subsequently, the MMS was started and it was changed as MBA. So if you look at every growth of a PhD institution linked with the society needs and society requirements. So any good institution will always look at the society development and society institutions. So that is how these institutions are developed. And today if you look at uh, the ranking of the PhD institution, almost all the institutions starting from College of Technology, Arts and Science is the top 10 in NAR of ranking, and College of Technology is top 20 in NAR of ranking, Business School is top 40 in uh, NAR of ranking, Medical College again top 30. And all, almost all the institutions are in the top 50 of NAR of ranking in the respective institutions. So that is where the quality was given importance. There is no, uh, as I said, no, all the faculty members are identified by the management, they were sent abroad and trained, got trained them in abroad, they brought back. We never hired anybody outside the PhD institution. Our own team, we developed it. So that is one of the great character of an institution builder. Coming back to PhD institute of management, I think one important thing which my co-speakers will also talk about is the investment of the faculty. We continue to invest the faculty, we identify them, we also look at what are the training needs requirement and recognition of the faculty. I think today most of you are business school directors know the problem of retaining the faculty. Today it's very difficult to retain the faculty, but uh, again, uh, not paying a money. There are good, some institutions may pay good salary, but people don't say stay in this institution just because of salary. I think the work environment is very, very important. So you have to empower the people, and also you have to increase the people. In fact, I was uh, traveling with Ray today morning. When within 20 minutes, he was able to talk to two, three people, greet them on birthday, and the teamwork he started, and he was giving them some assignment. So this is what a great institution builder does. So continuously encouraging the faculty members and investing on them. And the most important, another important thing which uh, my experience I have seen is the transparency and trust. I think uh, most of the people as a leaders know we don't trust our own subordinates and also we don't empower them. We always believe that uh, younger generation they don't have any responsibility or they don't do any work. I have seen some of the very senior most people even they don't allow the faculty members to do anything and minute by minute they monitor. I think if you start doing this kind of a thing, you know, you cannot build any institutions. And you don't give a good academic environment for faculty members to work in an organization. I think the most important today is the leaders in the academic institution uh, has to empower the faculty member. In fact, last week uh, I was hearing uh, our uh, Rao uh, about the institution building and leadership, how a leader he plays a major role. So he was explaining the role of a leader. See, any institution, if you look at you now, without the contribution of the leader, it doesn't uh, survive. So there is a lot of relationship between a good leader and a good institution. We have seen our own uh, life, our own experiences. A lot of institutions 
face the moment if the leader leaves the organizations. So the reason is the leader plays a major role because 